Hello, everybody, and welcome to RSC's March Roundtable. So for those of you that don't know, March is Women's History Month, and thus we decided our topic of discussion would be representation of women in STEM. Now, before we get into our actual presentation, I just want to give everyone a heads up. We will be recording this, but only my screen will be recorded, so you guys can turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, yeah. So my name is Varsha Van Katesen. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of programs for the Redmond STEM Center. So to preface preface our whole discussion, I wanted to start by introducing some statistics about the representation of women in STEM. So only 28% of STEM workers are women, which is just over a fourth, if to put that into perspective. And like the wage gap in other careers, other fields rather, women only earn 89 cents per every dollar the man makes. And another interesting thing is that only 24% of women who majored in engineering actually go on to pursue a career in the field. And for healthcare, about 80% of the workers are women, but only 21% of health executives and board members are, are women. Now, a lot of inventions we use in our daily lives are or were developed by women, but they often don't go credited for it. And a few that I wanted to draw attention to are the syringe, which was created by Letitia Gere in 1896, and Wi-Fi, which was developed by Heidi Lamar in 1942. In current news, there has been a lot of women that have been very prominent, and I wanted to highlight just a few of those. So first up, we have Sarah Everard. And for those of you that don't know, Sarah's story has been circulating the news a lot lately, as it has sparked a lot of conversation about women's safety and health, well-being, and the obstacles that stand in the way of that. And so Everard was walking home one night after work, and she was kidnapped and murdered, which is what caused so many conversations about women's safety to start happening. Swathi Mohan was, or is, an aerospace engineer and was the guidance and controls operations lead on the NASA 2020 Mars mission. And I know personally seeing another woman of color in a STEM related event as big as that made me really proud. So I just wanted to highlight that. And then we have Emmanuel Carpentier and Jennifer A. Doudna, who were the women that received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2020 for the development of CRISPR-Cas9, which is a really cool gene editing tool. So if you get a chance to look into that, I highly suggest doing so. And on the other side of my screen, I have some articles that all talk about different obstacles that women face in STEM fields. So I will be putting those in the roundtable chat. So if you guys want, go check those out after our discussion. All right. So our first question is, how do we engage women in STEM? And if you have something to say, feel free to just unmute and speak. I think um, the kind of the crux of this issue is, how do we make it so that women feel comfortable in, in like, kind of fields that are traditionally dominated by men because you mentioned sort of these incidents that have happened of late where women have been treated horrendously and abhorrently by men. Um, well, I agree. I believe that more and more often recently, this isn't about STEM specifically, but more and more often you're realizing, like people are realizing that women are treated horribly by men every single day. Like in social situations, in the workplace, just in general. Like I know on Instagram, you could probably see a lot of those, like 97% of women have been sexually harassed or, you know, harmed by men in unwelcome ways. And it's starkingly common to the point where I 
don't blame them for not wanting to, you know, be in a workplace with them. So I think <laughs> it's not easy to just engage more women in STEM, but there's a lot of things that need to be done. I don't know. Like there's a very uh, deep history of gatekeeping and stuff. Like, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been on TikTok and, like, seen a TikTok of, like, like CS major, like, talking to the girl in the class or anything. Because I've, I've gotten a couple of those, and maybe that's just my page, but, like, it, it's a funny joke. Uh, and it's usually, like, making light, it's making fun of, uh, like, the, the, the Stalinistic ideas in, like, computer science, where when you have a girl taking the class, it's like, hey, you want to be a study partner? And then, like, getting upset because the girl in the class, like, had a better program than you did, shit like that. But, like, um, that is, as much of, as it is a joke, that does happen. <laughs> that's, that's not a, it's not a, a false thing to happen. And I also, even not contemporarily, you can, like, look back at, uh, computer science history, and pretty much programming languages were pioneered by women, and that history gets driven into the ground because over time the men that came into the industry uh, reshaped it as like we don't want this to be something that is easy easily accessible and we don't want women to be the face of it and so it's kind of been driven into obscurity the fact that that women can be a part of the field <laughs> Yeah, I think those are all really good points. Does anybody else have anything to add? All right, and we can move on to our next question. Is what are some barriers present for women who are interested in STEM? We kind of touched on that in the last question too, but. I think the most, um, I mean, besides the ones that we've already mentioned were like, men are actively trying to keep women out of a field. Um, there are sort of societal norms that act as barriers for women. Like women um, aren't expected um, or yeah, they aren't really expected to take on certain jobs because it just isn't considered like girly to their, to, to society or, or, or whatever. Um, and the, like perceived femininity of a job definitely plays a role in whether or not a woman is interested in that in that um occupation I have a really specific example but like i have uh i have like more than one like female friend who so so like for me personally my like gateway into engineering was largely like video games i just really enjoy video games and so that being a part of my childhood inspired me to want to enter engineering um and i'm sure that that is a story for a lot of other people as well but like i have a couple female friends who just like vehemently hate video games um and, and i think that's also i think that's a, a product of the same same barriers when when you can't even access something that might introduce you to interest in engineering then like i mean you're obviously not going to be interested in engineering it's just interesting how i i think that a lot of things that would in, in spark interest in engineering have the same barriers for um for entry for women which makes it even more difficult for them to actually enter stem if that makes any sense yeah, yeah. for sure Yeah, I mean, I, I think there, it's all kind of intersectional, right? Or um, just the the like, traditional gender roles that are imposed upon women, like women from a young age, um, go on to affect their interests and um, everything they like to do from the, their job to um, their hobbies. And then that also then forces the next generation of, of women, which kind of sucks. <laughs> I don't know if this is relevant to this question specifically, 
but I, I've definitely seen like on TikTok, um, women in STEM that end up not liking it and feel stuck in their position to like continue it because they have to, you know, represent more women in the field. And I think that the potential of that happening could definitely be a barrier, I guess, to people wanting to be interested in it because they might be afraid of it being the wrong thing to do or something. But I guess that could be true for any career pathway, but still like, I think the fact that some few women are involved in STEM fields makes the expectations for them a bit higher and different stereotypes and like that kind of stuff also affects it. Yeah. And after uh, hearing, I think also it's important that like, what often when you look at like, like you won't see many idols, like, like role models in STEM, um, especially for women. Um, like obviously there's like a ton of like male CEOs or like of like huge tech companies, but when you look at like females, there's not as many like role models in that position of power. So when you look at like um, young, like like young women and girls who are trying to go into these fields, they don't have, they often don't have as many people to look up to. Um, yeah, representation is definitely something that might help a lot. <laughs> Sure. All right. Does anybody else want to add to this question? Okay. So move on to the next one. What are some personal anecdotes you have about our topic? No. Uh, in like elementary school. Uh, I, I just remember like there was a culture of like boys do math and science while girls are good at reading and writing. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, that was just kind of like a, an, a truth, a truth of elementary school. It's just like, this is something that, that everybody accepted. And it's like, I don't think that's actually true now, like looking back. Um, but it was something that was somehow instated. Um, I think it would be interesting to talk about like what what influences caused that to to happen <laughs> for for young kids to think that. Yeah, true. Like, I, I that that's actually like really relatable. Actually, um, I remember this one girl was the dominant like uh, book report giver. You know, she would always get fours. It's kind of crazy. Am I reinforcing the stereotype? Um, I think while many girls are interested in like English and humanities and whatever, like you you are sharing an example of someone who is is good at you know the humanities, right? But I don't think that by itself is reinforcing the stereotype. You're providing an example of it. But, um, like, there are everyone of every gender interested in everything, I don't know. Um, but it's definitely something to be aware of. I don't really know where I'm going, but... <laughs> no, that makes sense, that um, makes sense. I mean, yeah, like, it's not necessarily wrong that there are girls that, like, that... You know, like the humanities. Um, do you think that like that expectation is is like harmful? That, like or, or like that 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 culture that Arian mentioned, where uh, girls are good at the humanities or reading and writing. Like, do you think that actually translates to um, a noticeable sort of thing later on? I think it could. I mean, if you, like, you're obviously, I feel like people are going to pursue what they're, like, good at, right? That might, like, influence them. But, like, going back to, like, Arjun's initial question about, like, why why you think this is, exists in the first place, um, I think it's just because, like, obviously, I like, echoing back to, like, centuries ago, 
like men used to normally be like take take places in like science and um like at the world front and all all these bigger roles while women would normally be like at home taking care of the children and so just so like i feel like that like educational aspect of like teaching your women like i mean teaching your children how to like read the bible and like all that stuff really translated kind of i guess withdrew like or still maintained like all these hundreds of years later um where i don't know it's just like kind of um I don't know, something like antiquated that we really think about. I feel like women weren't expected to be literate at all until like relatively recently. So I, I don't I don't know like how that how that necessarily like panned out. I mean, I feel like they were they were supposed to be literate to like educate their children. Maybe I'm wrong. Like yeah, to like teach their children how to like read the Bible and all that stuff. Because that was like right, but I guess not like not lit. I guess literate is the wrong word. Like well read, they weren't supposed to be well read. Yeah, yeah, they, they were supposed to know enough to read, but I, I can't. I'm not someone who's uh, super informed on like the the history of literacy, so I, I can't say if what I'm saying is accurate. But as far as I know, uh, the expectation was not for them to be like. It, it's not a parallel of today where like elementary school girls are expected to be like have a better understanding of literature than the boys are right? at that time it was just like you should be able to read but like they're not writing book reports or anything it is still the men that are like writing uh things with deep like writing novels with, with deep themes and and like actually having a deep understanding of, of literature that was still a, a, a men's thing at the time i, I think <laughs> Yeah, I'd also like to add that um, I don't think it necessarily always roots back to, like, the very, like, old, like, Republican motherhood days. Um, Yo, a push, a push crossover? Yeah, a push but crossover? it's actually, like, a lot of it comes from just how people are raised in their households even today with, like, immigrant parents. Um, a lot of the time, like, the father, like they immigrate together and then it's kind of like the father is the main breadwinner still there's like that stigma and then the mom is supposed to be taking care of the children and like raising them and she's the one who like teaches like the kids how to read and write for example and then i think um people like the little kids will look at that dynamic and like kind of uh ingrain that into their brain for for when they like actually go into the real world, they kind of have like that sort of stig like stigma, which I don't think should be how should should be how it is. Like personally, my mom has always like kind of talked about how um, it was unfortunate that she wasn't able to pursue her like career because like as much because she had to like raise two children, and I think it the responsibility responsibility should be shared more and less of like a hindrance you know that, that is a really strong point now that they keep at it like i am also i'm a second generation immigrant um so both my parents moved here uh and like my dad both of my parents are like college educated but my dad is uh got like a full master's and like worked and all while like when i was born my mom was still working but she stopped working in order to, like, raise me. And I don't know. Like, she, she's also talked to me about the same thing. It's like, she, she could have, have done more. She started working again, but, like, I don't know. She, she took a sacrifice for, like, her personal... Uh, the, I don't really know what the word is. I don't want to say, like, intellectualism, but, but she... She she made that compromise in order to to raise kids, and I think that expectation is there, and that definitely, pro that probably definitely <laughs> plays a role in reinforcing this idea. <sighs> yeah, I I guess um, hmm. I'm thinking now, like and, ba and back in elementary school, maybe maybe this is like a element like the specific to my ele elementary school, but I think um the boys are kind of dumb. Uh, so girls are kind of better in like everything. I don't know, and I, I think I think it's interesting to observe because like at that young age, where like these gender norms aren't 
super ingrained yet. Um, like, I like I, I like uh you know boys. Th there is that room for a different dynamic to to kind of cultivate itself. I like I remember it. it, it what boys didn't go to college to get more knowledge. Like that was the girls thing. Boys went to Jupiter, where they got more stupider. <laughs> Thanks, so, for, thanks for that, Max. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know how many people I talked to about. I think it's just Arian here that I talked to. Yeah, I was gonna, like, I was gonna ask. Uh, I was um, gonna poke Everett. <laughs> yeah, we were discussing about how at one point in time, like how when you're younger, you see women as the more like intellectual and like, uh, the people, the role models that are there to impart knowledge on you, like your mom is the one that is teaching you these essential skills when you're young, like reading to you and it, like interacting with you in an intellectual level. And your father is like generically supposed to be like there to like discipline you and like do like fatherly stuff, but that does not include like a lot of intellectual activities. And then you go to school and majority of your elementary school teachers are like females, like almost every single one from like your first, from like kindergarten, pre-K to like, sixth grade like the only time you ever really run into male like teachers was like in pe or something and i think they're that, scary <laughs> yeah i think that that tends to lead people like down the idea that like women are supposed to be like more like intellectual during this time and then you get to like high school and like middle school and high school and then you learn a lot about how like like guys are supposed to shoulder like most of the like responsibility and do most of the work and it like changes the dynamic a lot on how like you view gender in the change from elementary school to middle school i believe and even more prominently in high school when you learn a lot more about history and that stuff um that was really interesting yeah it's hard to say how it like is relevant here but that that dynamic of when you're young you see these women like doing these intellectual things is definitely has impact on younger children. Yeah, like, it's actually weird, like, um, because people who have uh, had, women, like, female role models, female teachers, like, throughout their entire, like, childhood, um, and then they are simultaneously being kind of uh, taught that male figures in STEM have been doing like most of the, um, like it, like innovative heavy lifting almost. Um, like I don't know how that really like, how does that interact and pan out for a, ch a child's worldview? I mean, as a child, like I remember like thinking a lot about what Max just said. Like, I would. I remember my mom used to work like in the healthcare field, but after she had me, she uh, kind of quit to take better care of me. And then my sister came along, and she just kind of never went back into the healthcare field. Instead, she became a teacher. And so, like, I remember her like talking about how much she used to love her healthcare job and how much it used to be like fun, and she loved the community there was. But like. So, like, she always encouraged me, like, both my parents, they would always encourage me to pursue, like, a STEM-related field. And whenever I even brought up the idea of, like, maybe going into business or, like, like when I was in fifth grade, I dreamt of, like, opening a bakery. And, like, when I, when I brought those kind of things up, they'd be like, no, you're going to become a doctor or you're going to become an engineer. You're not going to go into, like, business or literature. You're not going to do any of that. But then, like, in school and with other communities, I'd always hear like women go into like other fields, like STEM is for men and women can go somewhere else. It's just, it was always a weird dynamic, but like, I never like fully understood like what I was being told because I was being told so many different things, you know? I think that's like an interesting cross between like, I don't know, like Asian culture and like just gender stereotypes i guess um because like when you look at asian culture like um especially in my family too it's like like your grandparents always ask like you want to be a doctor a lawyer engineer and like 
those are like the three options, I guess. And so it, it's kind of interesting, like how that culture has kind of developed, I guess. Um, because I'm sure that wasn't true for uh, women a while ago, or like that would be an option for them. But it's kind of interesting, like how that's developed. And um, I know we were talking a little bit earlier about like how like many parents, um, many of our like moms had to like uh, some sometimes forego their own careers to take care of their children. Um, I think like it, I, I guess maybe a positive, more positive development, um, at least in recent years, is that I've noticed like more big tech companies have started to offer like paternal care, paternal leave. Um, as well as maternal leave, so for the father as well. So I think going back to that, I guess, question about like um, making that responsibility more shared, I think that's pro probably a positive development that's been happening recently. Yeah, but I think it's fair to point out that the, like, even though there is like, there have been steps forward, actually, I'm not, wait, like, Chris, wait, have they actually been giving, um, more maternal leave and stuff yeah um yeah i i know from like experience that the, uh, um we're at microsoft they give three months paternal leave and six months maternal so, okay yeah but that, that's like abysmal compared to like european countries yeah I, no my point is just that like they've started to offer paternal care i mean paternal leave when that was even oh really oh, that's, yeah that's, cool. that's what i'm trying to say oh um, yeah that's pretty cool Okay, anybody else want to add to this question? Okay, what are some common stereotypes? How can we avoid that? Um, I kind of wanted to say something that was kind of related to something earlier. But, like, something that I've noticed in high school is that, like, a very big majority of English classes that I've taken are female, like, advanced AP or honors English classes. There are, are generally more girls than guys in them, or at least that's for sure for some of them, um, this year especially. And when you compare that to either the equal or greater number of guys in like AP science classes, I think it's something of to note. Like, of course, girls are allowed to like literature and guys are allowed to like science, but like when it's such a stark difference, I, I don't know, you kind of start to question what, what's going on a little bit, whether it's that, you know, females aren't being encouraged to challenge themselves in science classes or that they're like only told to do that in English and like humanities. So it's, it's interesting. And another thing I wanted to bring up was that um, sort of related to the stereotype thing is that, you know, why were all of our elementary school teachers female? Like, yeah <laughs> i know there's a historical reason like we learned briefly about it that um females began to get, take more jobs in teaching and education but like when we all have that shared experience of all of them being female you know it's, it's interesting i don't know if anyone wants to comment on that or move on yeah well i think that the one of the biggest reasons is like um, I talked about like uh, guys are kind of encouraged to take on these STEM fields, um, and while girls like maybe um, teaching is seen as a more like feminine, typically feminine job, and I, I don't know actually. That's that's a really interesting question. Maybe it's just because, like, my, my relationship with femininity is completely, I don't even know, but I don't feel like jobs have to be feminine or masculine. Like I don't think just, so either, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't see te teaching as a feminine job. I just think of it as, like, statistically, I'm pretty sure there's 
more, you know, elementary or middle school female teachers. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, and then you go into like the more collegiate level, like universities and uh, professors are like mostly male. And then it's really interesting to see like how that developed, like what historical like situations caused that to happen. I think for like the female teachers being or elementary school teachers being mostly female, I think it had to do with like a stigma of like, oh, um, you're like working with a bunch of little kids, right? That's a very maternal like type job. Um, pe like people who are like, um, like are supposed to take supposed to in quotation marks, supposed to take care of um, like their own children would be, be would be best suited to like be teachers for little ones, right? So, I guess that's that's one of the reasons I think it's become such a common common trope i mean also it's perpetuated because like you do see all these females doing this you're like so they're just supposed to be women so you see like yeah girls grow up and be like well i should be a teacher because that's the thing that women do yeah also there's like the whole meme about like professors not caring about the students they're just there to do research right um so it would, it would kind of make sense given that like men are generally encouraged to take these like higher level stem jobs and there's not as much like room for for women because of like this um you know a, a glass ceiling or whatever um so i, I mean i think it, it makes sense given the the way that society sees like as these gender roles for like the professors who are you know a, a professor is much more prestigious than like a elementary school teacher which unfortunately um is how society sees it so you know men end up taking those roles How can computer science be made attractive to everyone? Um, you know, I think something that's really important is that we that girls be expected to, or girls have, like, for girls to have the expectation that they should be good at, you know, math and, and science from a very, for a young age, because it feels like once you're in, like, middle or high school and you start actually engaging in computer science, um, like, the interest in that sort of work, in that, like, the very logical, the very, um, like, math-based, um, uh, like, you know, field is, is already set in stone. Like if you haven't worked with it much in your, um, in your childhood, you're very, you're not very likely to be interested now. Like, unless, you know, it, it, it just does, it just hasn't aligned with anything you've, you've done before. So there's not really much of a reason for you to take interest in like at, at that time. I kind of want to extend the question to the like 2.7 women here. Um, like what, being in the Redmond STEM Center server here, why are you interested in STEM? You can totally break timings if you use his TPs correctly. But yeah, I think... I think okay. personally, it's just... Oh, why are you yeah. going, Dan? No, Barsha, you can go. You're, um, uh, and I'm right. That's probably a joke I shouldn't make. You can go. <laughs> Um, okay. Okay, then. Um, what was I saying? Oh, I was saying I wanted to go into, like, the STEM field because, one, I've always been, like, told that I have to go into STEM. Like, I guess that's the Asian culture that I've always been exposed to. But, like, 
too, it's like I I come from like like almost everyone on my mom's side of the family is in healthcare. And so like a little part of me has like always wanted to like continue that and like just like become a doctor or do something in healthcare. Like that's part of the reason why I've always wanted to go into the medical field and like I guess apart from that, I just always wanted a job that I can work, like, that I can work for, but will, like, earn me respect, allow me to give back on a daily basis, and just something that's, that's, like, gonna make me feel rewarded for, like, all the work I put in. Like, going into the medical field is a huge commitment like there's so much work that goes into it but at the end like you become a doctor or whatnot and it's just like everything's going to be paid off so then does that make sense yeah um i have a question were, were there any like moments like in your life or like in some some course you took or anything that like helped you kind of get become more attracted to stem in general or was there like a person a role model anything that we can like take away um... eric you want to take away varsha's role model <laughs> <laughs> okay uh... <laughs> i don't I don't think so. Like, for the longest time, I always kind of knew that, like, STEM is, like, where I'm going. But, like, I think, like, okay, I think the one person that, like, actually sparked it for me that, like, kind of was, like, healthcare is, like, where I want to go for sure. Like, I think I was my freshman year bio teacher. I had Mr. Hayes or any of you that go to Redmond. I think all, almost all of you do. But anyway, um, he was just, like, very encouraging. He always, like, like, I don't know how to describe it. It was just, like, he gave everyone an equal chance at everything. Like, it was never like, oh, you're a guy, you should be able to do whatever it is we're working on. Oh, you are a girl, you should be able to do whatever you're working on or whatnot. It was more like, oh, you're a person in this class, you should be able to do this, kind of thing. And I guess that kind of, like, helps with, like, thinking, oh, I can do this. Like, this is something I have a good opportunity to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really good to hear that you had a teacher and, like, you know, a mentor for you to make them something you wanted to pursue. And I think that if we had, if more girls had that at a younger age, then it would, you know, help at least a little bit because I feel like, or at least in my experience, a lot of girls might think that, you know, I'm bad at math or, you know, I'm not good at science or something. Um, and then they feel discouraged by it and aren't given the encouragement to potentially take it to a, you know, to have a better relationship with STEM. So I think that mentor role was a very important one for him and Mr. Hayes is pretty cool. <laughs> um, I think responding to Arian's comment question thing as I'm assuming one of the less than 0 0.7 women here, um, Wait, I didn't phrase that right. Anyways, <laughs> I think I'm, for me, I became interested in STEM starting around fourth grade when I got into competitive math at my elementary school. Like I did one of those tests and I just scored pretty well and stuff. So I wanted to keep doing it. And that's, I mean, I've always liked math, I guess, like, my, both of my parents are in computer science, and that's probably going to make a big impact on my perception of STEM and everything. So my, my experience probably isn't universal. Well, definitely isn't universal, but like I've 
always had an inclination towards math and starting competitive math helped me with that. And even though I don't really do that as often anymore, I still want to continue, you know, doing math and getting better at it. And that's why I'm interested in STEM, I guess. I never really like. I I also I have a weird relationship with uh, femininity as well. I'll say because I I had a <laughs> my upbringing and stuff. But like I I just um there was no point in my life that I didn't think about going into STEM. So it's a hard question for me to answer. Like I I was just like a child, and my dad was a computer scientist, and my mom, uh, though not not computer scientist worked at Microsoft even then uh so it's like I just always have this idea that that's where I'm going I don't know what other option I have it's like a relatively recent thing that I've considered like other careers even with that said I'm still like pretty hard set on that I want to go into STEM but like I've, I've, I've like thought about other things but only only recently <laughs> I guess that's just another example of parental influence, though. We're all out here. Identity foreclosed. <laughs> Never considered another option. A question I have, I guess, is like... How influential is... Is like the, oh, I, I can't do this because I'm not expected to do this mentality um, in in your career choice, do you guys think? I don't think I can answer that concretely, but I think that with considering that question, a lot of the that barrier is is subconscious. Like, it's not like... I, I think... That, I mean, I can't say for sure, but I feel like it's, it's more likely that the idea doesn't even pop into your head because you already have the wall there as opposed to like, can I be a computer scientist? No, I'm a woman. You know? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I also think it's largely subconscious. Like, for me, my parents never told me that they expected me to go into STEM, I think. But it was, like, implied and... Um, even though I don't, I'm still interested in STEM, I don't want to do something explicitly STEM for the rest of my life, I think. And, um, like, I don't know if this analogy is supposed to work th both ways, but, like, I never really considered majoring in the humanities, you know? Um, so I bet people definitely might at least a little bit feel the way the same way about STEM. Like they just never considered that to be a career maybe, or they wouldn't seriously pr pursue it. So it's not always a conscious thought. I was just gonna say, like, for me, it's a lot like what Ari was saying, like, like, uh, they were so much better than I can, but, like, like, being your own, like, barrier, in a way, like, I just sort of never pictured myself going into any field other than STEM, mostly because of, like, being raised in a way that, like, I was just sort of told, you're going into STEM. Like, you're not going to consider anything else, but, yeah. 
sorry. Uh, I was going to add that, like, if we kind of circle around back to the question, how can computer science or the STEM in general be made attractive to everyone? Um, what I've, like, garnered from your experiences, I think one of the biggest ways we can make it attractive to everyone is to, like, especially women, is to kind of um, give, like, STEM opportunities and give people the chance to like be hands on and actually do STEM very early on in their like academic career before like that stigma kind of develops because we've talked about how like in elementary school people don't like there isn't as much of that like si stigma about STEM specifically um, there is the hum humanities and um, like science and math divide but it's not like concrete and I think we talked about how as you get into like high school and stuff then people start to like develop their identities to the point where it's like they don't even consider the other other side as an option so giving opportunities early such as like math competitions or like I don't know robotics or anything like that I think it would be very valuable to like help engage everyone in STEM early instead of just um, a lucky couple, you know, or people who are like naturally inclined to STEM. I think more than just opportunities are important in like this question, like. Making it, I don't know if this is, this is bad, but um, making it less of a choice to like go into STEM and just like having people at least experience it, like make that re required, you know? Yeah. That would. Have I think including. Yeah. I mean, there are like STEM education is like pretty baseline, I think, like math and stuff, math and science specifically, that's, these are things that everyone is exposed to from a young age, and it's the same as, like, art and other things, I think, like art and humanities. I think it's, like, this is definitely something that people are exposed to from a young age. You can't, it's not like they never interact with STEM. But I think, like, it's hands-on STEM and, like, what you do for a job for STEM is very different than... Uh, like learning about like the life cycle the of, a, of a bean. I agree. Or, I agree with that. Like just learning like uh, multiplication and division, right? Like I think you know how like back in the day um, in elementary school they would have like days where you just do art. Like some guest speaker would come and like yeah, know, yeah, a basket like, or like do yeah. some yeah. pastels. That was fire. They that was... could do something like that, but like they bring like a robotics kit or they bring like some electrical circuit board and you just have like a couple days or a day of just like that type of hands-on learning because i feel like doing mm -hmm. those stem things i did like a couple si uh summer camps like before sixth grade that were similar and that's like actually what kind of got me into stem and mm -hmm. i remember in fifth grade we did like a marine biologist um like field trip thing and after that, I wanted to be a marine biologist for quite a while. So wait, was it on the boat? Yeah, the the one on the boat. Dude, that was sick. That was right? so fun. Yeah. That was sick. Yeah, that kind of stuff is like really helpful, I think. Yeah. And so, like your point about like hands-on versus mm -hmm. just multiplication tables is really important. Yeah. I agree. Were you gonna say something? Not really. Okay. But, like, I think STEM, as in for computer science, also to be introduced at, like, elementary school. Because, like, I didn't even, I took AP CSA last year, and I literally didn't know anything before that about coding. Like, I didn't even comprehend what Scratch was before that. So, I think, you know, having that exposure early, especially as, you know, the world gets more technologically aligned and advanced it's important and it's not like there's a lack of entry-level coding like at education that can occur like it's not hard to it's sh or it should not be really difficult to develop curriculums for younger students for uh cs in particular 
Yeah, but I, I mean, there's like those coding camps and like uh, classes out there, right? I feel like those have always kind of existed. It just the accessibility of those to certain certain populations, but not also optimal. Not it's also not the same as having it in school, like, as a thing that you are, like, a class that you are required to take. That, re like, out of school, like, extracurriculars to look for, like, computer science and, like, that sort of education for, like, younger elementary school age kids is, like, it requires the parents to go and, like, want their kids to do this. And if the parents don't think that, like, their kids should be learning, like, computer science at a young age, then they don't have a choice, right? Like, it's not like they... Um, there, there's a good chance that they will not end up getting any of that education if it's just if it's optional yeah do you think there should be like a, a CS day then like you know how there's like uh, those days where the salmon lady would come in right uh, <laughs> and talk about salmon and and milt um, I mean, I think that, like, the type of, like, interactive, like, guest speakers and stuff or, like, having that those for, like, STEM education would be helpful. Wait, did you guys have, like, the science guy come to your school and, like, you would have an assembly in elementary school and everyone would, like, watch him, like, in, uh, <laughs> mix chemicals together and then um, ask for volunteers and then do some magic trick or something with, like, static friction or something? Uh, he would do the um. He would bring in the Tesla coil, right? Or, or like the or the Jacob's ladder, and then um. Oh yeah. Like have the, like, the electricity and everything, and it'd be sensational. <laughs> yeah, like more more of those things are cool. And I also remember there was like a coding thing, like Hour of Code, I think it was called, where you yeah. just like play around with Scratch. But the problem was that with that was like. It was literally like one hour in an entire year where people yeah. would think it's fun, but they would never like finish the actual project or get anywhere or get hooked to a point where like I think it would make a larger impact. Like it's definitely a step in the right direction, but I think just being a little bit more like comprehensive. This sounds like public education gap. Yeah. I think this is even extended to, like, high school, where, no, like, there are a bunch of, like, career-connected learning, like, um, electives, but a lot of people still, like, just don't have, like, either time on their schedule or just there's, like, some stigma around it that they're, like, joke classes or, like, free classes that um, don't really prepare you for the future, so... I think that's also something people need to tackle. So, like, if you want to go into aerospace engineering, um, personally, I would rather take AP Physics than the, like, aerospace engineering class, just because I feel like that would be more, like, applicable and high level, but, um, I think we should somehow try and, like, remove that, that, like, um, I don't know, the the air around those types of classes. Stigma. Yeah, but I, I said stigma so many times today, it felt like, it felt weird. <laughs> Go to thesaurus.com and figure out some of this. Yeah, I, I think that's more of a... I don't think that stigma is like even evenly distributed across like people like um for us since you know lots of us are accustomed to taking AP classes and stuff it it there's a bit more of a stigma around normal not AP or honors classes but then I I do know a lot of you know my peers who are genuinely interested in classes and we'll take those electives like it's it it is the severity of the issue i think varies um but yeah and i think i don't know if we like touched on this but like 
there's not that many opportunities in middle school for people to be exposed to STEM, to STEM like without them going out of their way to do it, I feel like. Because, um, you know, elementary school, they had those art days. They had those science science fair, science, the science guy comes in. But, like, I don't remember any of that happening in middle school. So it was kind of it's kind of interesting that it just stops for three years when people are like starting to develop a conscious idea of what they want to do and I think middle school would be an important time period to think about oh my god you're right like wait what have they been doing um for middle school stuff like we had we had like fundraiser assemblies or like and motivational speaker assemblies but like what is there to motivate when you're not when you're not like you don't know what you want to do? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of weird because middle school they had like a couple of STEM related like electives, but um, like for me, I I had like you had to take PE and I had orchestra and stuff like, so there wasn't a chance for me to take them. I don't know yeah. If that would change anything, but yeah. Yeah, I think also like like middle school and like high school electives, um, like CTE classes. It's really hard to design a curriculum for those because you know there are students who like have no experience now whatsoever. They're taking it as a introductory course, like a one hundred and one. But then like there are students who actually like want to learn. Maybe they have had some exposure. They want to like have a greater amount. So it, I feel like in order to make it truly accessible to all students, like, there has to be a better way to do it than how they are doing it now. I don't know. I mean, like, they, they, I guess the most, the easiest way they could do, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing. I was just going to move on to the next question. Like, like, oh. I think the easiest way they, they could do this is, like, with different level of classes, right? Like, like, um, like CS. Like, do we have do we have an introductory to CS class in, at at RHS? Is that a thing? CSP, CSA, CSA is probably not like super introductory, but like it's pretty easy. But also CSP oh. is. Um, there's like it would be daunting. For there's sure, like so. CSE, right? Like computer science and engineering, which oh, you don't. Right. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, you don't like actually code in that. Long. I talk. It's yeah. You hmm. kind of you have like, like block coding, yeah. and um, most of it's like engineering stuff but, right but it is pretty it, it, I, i've heard it's a pretty good class yeah but like um there it just maybe if we had like sort of where it's college where there's different levels of like that one uh course that you're taking um but I, then the, the problem is just the not enough teachers um at a school right teachers can only teach so many courses more depth in computer science would be really nice. But also, like, I feel like there's... CSA is not that bad for an intra-level course. I think... Okay, first I want to respond to Max. I think, like, funding would definitely be something that is a barrier to these things happening, right? Like, advancing this type of education would be a big investment, and I don't know... <laughs> Uh, tax, tax, tax funded school systems. I don't know how well, how much money they're really getting. Um, as for AP CSA, I think the idea that it's an AP class could definitely defer people. Like maybe it's, a, it was introductory, introductory for me, for example, but like a lot of people wouldn't think of it as that because it's a, it's an AP class. So like things like that make like Max's point make sense, I think, where actually introductory level classes might, might help. I feel like it'd be better if it was like spread out through like middle school and stuff, like getting it and like it builds up into the high school curriculum. I think that would be a more effective way to do it. Oh yeah? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, wait, what was I going to say? Were, were there CS classes in middle school or is it all just it like, was like robotics? 
I had that. I never took that class, but there was a robotics class. You guys had robotics? What? Uh, yeah, Mr. Buckingham. <laughs> Mr. Buckingham. Um, rip oh. Mr. Buckingham. Yeah. Rip. Oh. Wait, is he out? Did he get fired? He's dead. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting he was placed on administrative leave. Yeah, no, not quite. Well, some would consider it such. That's unfortunate. Okay. That's I never sword. took the class, so I couldn't say about like what it actually taught. But yeah. Okay. Anything else to add to this question? How can men help and become slash become more aware and supportive of women in STEM? Can we get some non non men answers here? <laughs> Uh, first of all, stop mansplaining things. Like, it gets, it gets so annoying. Well, like, I'll be, like, talking about something, or I'll ask a stupid question because I'm just a little bit slow. But they'll explain it to me as if I'm, like, an elementary schooler, or, like, even younger, for heck's sake. It's, it gets on my nerves, but, yeah, there's that. And, like, also just... Being more inclusive and not automatically having lower standards for me, like, that would help a lot. Like, yeah. I feel like there's more, I'm just sort of like right now. I, I mean, this is something that comes up every time this discussion happens, but, like, just if you see someone being, like, like practicing harmful behaviors, call them out for it. There's, like, I, I have, I think I know more about, like, how this culture exists in, like, game dev industry, because that's, like, my interest, but, like, if any of you guys have ever followed what goes on with, like, Riot Games, they, they have this, uh, have a lot of controversy about, like, their workspace has this kind of bro culture is what people call it and so like what being like a woman in that culture you just get like very ostracized and objectified and it's just very difficult for you to participate in anything if you see people contributing to that kind of culture uh just do your part and like call them tell other dudes to not <laughs> not be not be um i will not use uh, choice language because of the published, <laughs> but <laughs> just hold them Richards. accountable. Yeah. Wait, so what do you mean by bro culture exactly? Ha have you ever, like, played, like, like League or Valorant and, like, there's a woman in your lobby and, like, all the dudes in the lobby have treated uh, them in, in, like, a... Very, uh... Demeaning way. Yeah. Have you ever encountered that? Yeah, yeah. That, that there's so not just that, but like I, I remember um there's a whole Kotaku like essay about about this specific thing, which I can link it afterwards. But like being a woman who ends up at Riot Games, uh, you're like constantly expected to prove yourself. Like in the interview process, they. They had uh, you took like a male employee and a woman employee with the same statistics, and the woman employee would be asked extra questions like some some specific detail about a game that they mentioned playing, like that they used to play World of Warcraft. It's like, oh really? Uh, what was like the hardest dungeon that you did? It's like there's this constant expectation that you have to prove that you're actually like a gamer, that you you're, you're really one of the you're like the others you're expected to not have the same level of understanding and so that kind of thing presents itself 
not like the whole time you're the company. You go to like a, a board meeting and you'll say an idea and people will talk over you on purpose. And like somebody else will repeat your idea five minutes later and they'll get um they'll get praise for it. It's just this this kind of thing happens uh very often. You could call it microaggressions, I guess. And uh I think a lot of men are not aware of it happening. So, something to pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, I think that's even more reinforced by the fact that, like, a lot of men are in the administrative or, like, the authority positions in those companies, right? Like, where they they naturally kind of um, maybe feel more inclined to uh, interact more familiarly with men because they are men themselves, which would be solved by having a more diverse executive set. <laughs> Yeah, I do think changing, like, having different voices be heard in administrative groups would help companies, you know, actually figure out how to be more inclusive and stuff. And, yeah, sort of building off of Aryan's point that women are oftentimes not taken seriously in the real world, whether that's at work, in games, or, like, just in general, like even today, it's ridiculous how how women are treated just because of, you know, gender. And I think one way that men can help be more supportive of that is to actually listen when women are telling about their experiences or their problems and like not but yeah, like Arian said, not being a bystander in those types of harmful, toxic environments, because those are what contribute to this being such a big issue. Yeah, and like Andrew was saying, like also not belittling like women's struggles. Like, you can see it now when everyone's, like, talking about the 97% and everyone's, like, like, you so many guys are, like, no way it's 97%. Like, it's got to be, like, false. Like, the sample size is so small, it can't be actually 97%. Like, instead of focusing on the actual statistic, like, focus on the fact that it's that high or that, like... So many women have dealt with that kind of thing, you know? Also, getting rid of the double standards would really help a lot. Like, a lot of- part of the reason that you don't see a lot of women in, like, administrative positions is because, like, when a woman is, like, confident or assertive or, like, like, a good leader, everyone's like, oh, she's so bossy, she's like, 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 well, um, certain language to describe her with like negative connotations whereas if you saw a guy with those qualities you'd be like oh he's such a great leader he's such like a perfect person for this position you should give it to him like that kind of thing I think those were all like really good points. We are closing in on like an hour and ten minutes. So does anyone have any like final words? Do we have any questions left? By the way, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that's right. yeah. That was the last one. Um, if anyone, if no one has any other things, we can wrap up and call it the day. All right. So. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, there's my dog in the background, if you can hear him. But uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. If you have any other questions about RSC or any future events in general, feel free to reach out to me or any other members on the team. We'd be happy to answer. And I will put 
the articles I mentioned earlier in the chat, but also we have a feedback survey that we would like to get your opinions or like your, we would like your feedback. So I will, I just put that in the chat. If you guys can fill that out when you get a chance, that would be very much appreciated. Also, so um, the people who like didn't